Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Bay City Players as we present another original play. My name is Mike Wisniewski, and I am glad you have joined us for our eighth online performance. Last week, we brought you an original play by Michigan playwright Michael Allen Herman. Tonight, we are thrilled to present another original play, Shostakovich in New York by Michigan playwright T.E. Klunzinger. Bay City Players is excited to participate in the Make Art Virtual Campaign started by our friends at Midland Center for the Arts. We would also like to thank our season sponsors, Chemical Bank, Independent Bank, Landall Packaging Systems, Skorupski Family Funeral Home and Cremation Services, Wildfire Credit Union, and Michigan Sugar. Our doors might be closed, but hopefully not for long. And we are dedicated to our mission of providing high quality theatrical experiences for the entertainment, education, and enrichment for the community. The show must go on, but virtually. So a lot has happened over, the, over these last months. Um, this COVID disease, floods, individuals standing up for what is right, and theaters closed until it is safe to open up again. So whatever your passion is, please consider making a contribution to any of these worthy causes. And as always, donations to help Bay City players are appreciated. A little bit from the playwright, Shostakovich in New York, a mostly true story. In March 1949, under difficult circumstances, composer Dmitry Shostakovich was part of the Soviet delegation to the Cultural and Scientific Congress for World Peace at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. He had been told to deliver an, an unpalatable speech, but he got any, and he got through it, perhaps, perhaps helped by a host with some uh, much provided um, novel stress relief. And the playwright also states he has always liked the waltz number two. So when reading more about Mr. Shostakovich, he noticed that he had come to New York in 1949 and it just sort of took off from there. So with our doors closed, we are grateful to use this platform to connect with each other. So feel free to comment as the show goes on and let us know what you think. Our cast comes to you with little rehearsal time and without access to our theater has found props and costumes to use from their own home. Now, if you're interested in participating in future programs such as these, please send us a message on our Facebook page, Bay City Players, or message me personally, MJ Wisniewski, and I will add you to our list of actors. Also stay tuned for our next performance, more about that at the end of the show. And now I would like to introduce the cast. So when I call your name cast, please um, give the audience a wave, tell us where you're from and what character you are playing. Andy Harrington. I'm Andy Harrington from Midland, and I'll be playing Dmitry Dmitrievich Shostakovich. Katie McLean Peters. You have to unmute yourself. Hi, I'm in Midland, and I'm now unmuted, and I'm playing Nina Shostakovich. <laughs> John Tanner. Hello, uh, I am from Auburn, and I will be playing Stalin and Olin Downs. Ryan Smith. Hi, my name is Ryan Smith. I'm from Midland, and I'll be playing the role of Ivan Prashovsky. Kevin Prophet. I am from beautiful Bridgeport, Michigan, and I am playing Ivan Solertinsky. Thad Van Tiflin. Hello, I'm Thad Van Tiflin, and I'm playing Harlow Sh Shapley, and I'm from Basin, Michigan. Brianne Donnelly. Hi, I'm from Bay City, Michigan, and I'm playing Miss Caswell. Jessica McFarland. Hi, I'm from Bay City, Michigan, and I'll be playing the questioner as well as the speaker and a few other small roles. Okay, and tonight we have Jacob Kaufman behind the scenes making sure everything sounds and runs smoothly. Last but not least, our narrator tonight is M. Thomas. Hi, I'm and from I Midland. Think she is Yep, she has her video. There she is. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Now sit back and hopefully you have a drink and snacks in hand and enjoy Shostakovich in New York. Act one, scene one. Lights up on the Shostakovich apartment in Moscow. Dmitri writes at a small desk. 
He is about 40, of medium height with thick glasses. He chain smokes and is usually nervous. Hello? Yes, this is? Yes, he is. What? I don't believe you. You are joking. Oh, no, 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 no. no. I meant no disrespect. It's just that Comrade Stalin has never called here before. Oh, he, yes. Yes, I will. It's for you. It, it's Comrade Stalin. As Dimitri takes the phone, lights up on a small area where we see Stalin, still looking robust at age 70, on the telephone. Apparently, Comrade Molotov didn't take no for an answer. Hello, this is Dmitry Shostakovich. This is Comrade Stalin. It is good to talk with a great Soviet composer such as yourself. It gave us all great hope to hear your symphony played for the first time from Leningrad during the war. It was a difficult time for Mother Russia, comrade. It was the least I could do. Thank you for the compliment. Yeah, you have heard of the Cultural Scientific Congress for World Peace to be held in New York next month? I have. And you have heard that we would like you to represent the Soviet Union at the Congress? I have. Well then, what is your answer, comrade? I'm afraid I cannot go, comrade Stalin. I'm not well. It's been a hard winter, and that would be a very long trip to make. Mm, yes. From what I hear, you smoke like a chimney, drink like a fish, and have very bad eyes. But other than that, you do reasonably well. I will send my doctors to make sure of this. Anything else? Who else would be representing the Soviet Union? Ah, well, uh, let's see. There is, uh, let me check. There is uh, Comrade, Comrade Fazeev. Oh, you wrote uh, the music for his film, yes? It was based on his book. Ah, of course. And uh, there is a comrade Gerasimov. Uh, he is also in the film. Comrade Oparin, the biologist. Comrade Pavlenko, another film artist. Uh, comrade uh, Tirelli, he also works in film. So, <laughs> you see, Dmitry Dmitrievich, we need you to provide the balance for all these film people. Oh, well, that wouldn't work at all, comrade. Why not? Even in America, you are known as a great Soviet composer. You represent the best in Soviet music. That's exactly my point, comrade. How can I represent the best of Soviet music when my works can't be performed? They are banned. What? Who says this? We do not ban music in this country. I'm sure you have not done that personally, Comrade Stalin. But last year, Comrade Zhdanov launched his campaign against bourgeois formalism and accused not only me, but also Prokofiev, Khachaturian, and others of being offenders. Since then, I've lost my teaching position and nobody wants to play my music. As I said, it's been a hard winter. I, uh, I I do not know, Comrade Zdanov, but in our great country, we must make sure that all our great music can be heard. I will make it very clear that nobody can outlaw music just because he he doesn't understand it. And I will send my doctors to see you in the morning. Now, what do you say? Well, since you put it like that, Comrade Stalin... Uh... I'm sure I have no choice but to accept. It would be an honor to represent Soviet music at the Congress. Excellent. I'm sure you will do a job very well. I suggest you have a small glass of vodka to celebrate. I probably will. Thank you for calling, Comrade Stalin. The pleasure is mine. 
Comrade Shostakovich, have a good journey. Lights out on Stalin. Dmitri slumps slightly as Nina steps over to him. So you're going to New York. What did he say to you? Dmitri proceeds to pour himself a vodka. Only that he will make sure my music is no longer banned, as well as that of all the others. He's sending his doctors to check me in the morning. Can you go back to the conservatory? We really need the money. Perhaps, but the film work pays well enough. And when the film starts, uh, they kind of have to play the music. Maxim and Galina have had to get through the winter with only their old clothes. So have I. I think we all have to wait till spring to get anything new. Well, what about New York? I hear they have wonderful things there. American cigarettes. I had some once. No. They're much better than ours. I meant for me and for the children. Of course. But I don't know how much money I can take or how many things I can bring back. You know, it was almost funny when Comrade Stalin said, nobody can outlaw music just because he doesn't understand it. Because that's exactly what he did. What was it, uh, 13 years ago? I was pregnant with Galina. Yes, I was on my way to a concert tour, but returned to Moscow just in time for the first performance of My Lady Macbeth at the Bolshoi. It had been a very popular work from the time it opened two years before. The show had actually started before I could get backstage, and then Solertinsky came flying at me. Dmitri, that this is terrible news. Stalin is here with half the Politburo. He hates almost everything written after the revolution. All he really likes is Georgian folk songs. Why did they come? Who knows? Maybe they got drunk and came on a dare. All I know is they're thugs. They have no culture. We must pray that somebody gets sick and they have to stop the show. I don't think that will happen. Maybe I should go cut a sandbag loose and tie myself to it. Come, we can watch from that place on the side of the stage. Maybe they're too drunk to stay awake. Lights up on Stalin, watching the action and chatting with his unseen companions. Ivan and Dmitri stare out at us. And so we watched. Stalin and the others, taking their cue from him, made a face and shuddered every time the press was at all loud. And the percussion. It was certainly nothing like a Georgian folk song. And then we got to the scene where Sergei and Katerina made love. It was supposed to be a tender moment. They laughed. They almost wouldn't stop laughing. I couldn't watch them anymore. It's in today's Pravda. It sounds like Stalin wrote it himself. Well, what does it say? The headline says uh, model instead of music. This piece is formalist, coarse primitive and vulgar. It is an insult to the advancement of Soviet culture. Blah, blah, blah. It goes on from there. My, how times change. It was just two years ago that Pravda said my opera was, uh, let me recall, a general success of socialist construction. It could have been written by only by a Soviet composer brought up in the best tradition of Soviet culture. And that was after I failed my exam in Marxist terminology, methodology. I think something is starting to happen. What do you mean? And don't tell me you haven't noticed. Several of my friends, I just don't see them anymore. One of them, I saw his wife on the street and I said, where's Nikolai? She just stared at me and practically ran away. Ah. Yes, I have not seen Maxim, you know, the one who likes Mahler, uh, since last month. What do you suppose happens to them? I'm sure they were arrested. They said or did something wrong. Yes, but I mean after that. Prison? Or the firing squad? Or something worse. When I was a boy, my parents said if I didn't behave, the Tsar's men would take me to Siberia. 
mine too. But at that age, going to Siberia sounded like fun. Maybe I should just put a chair out in the hallway and study music until they come for me. Then at least they wouldn't bother my wife. Some of them like to do that anyway. One of them takes you away while the other one goes and rapes your wife, even though she's pregnant. Siberia does sound like fun. You know, Ivan Alexievich, this could easily be the last time we see each other. Unless we end up at the same camp. <laughs> if we end up in a camp. If we end up in a camp. But, but what have you done? Ah. The leading proponent of Mahler in Moscow. Someone might decide he's a dangerous influence. Did I introduce you to Mahler? Or was it Mahler introduced me to you? In that case, I'll have to thank him. I thought Mahler was dead. Perhaps he's just in a camp somewhere. He could write a serenade for us. It's been, what, nine years now. I was somewhat offended when you married Nina. Yeah, one has to keep up appearances, you know. I won't join the party, but at least I can be married. And now there's the child. Yeah, I'm finding I like women more and more. <laughs> they provide a pleasant diversion. But not always the same one. In the old days, the church would say, you were a bad boy. But now, the church is gone. That's... Just today, I'm still a bad boy. A very, very bad boy. Dimitri! The doctors are here. Are you decent? Of course. I just uh, fell asleep in my chair. Send them in. Lights out. Lights up on Dimitri in a blocky business suit, sitting in one of two airplane seats, apparently looking out the window. A middle-aged man approaches with a drink in his hand to sit next to Dimitri. Thought you might like another drink to help steady your nerves. I've had several drinks already. My nerves will never be steady. I'm trying to help. This is the longest flight I've ever been on. I'm reminded of flying out of Leningrad during the war. The Germans were shooting at us. And, uh, no one is shooting at you now, Dmitry Dmitrievich. You are quite safe. There, there are icebergs down there, I guess. Yes, but they are dangerous to ships, not airplanes. You have nothing to worry about. We could lose altitude and hit the iceberg. Always looking on the bright side of things, I see. We are Russians. It's one of the things we do best, yes? Uh, that, uh, consuming great amounts of vodka. But of course, to help us forget the bad things. In <sighs> Tell me, Comrade Rajarsky. How long have you been with the KGB? I am not. I am secretary and interpreter for the Soviet delegation to the peace conference. That's my job. Of course. You always thought secretaries were women. They are very good workers. <laughs> of course they are. But I am valued for my skills as an interpreter. I have studied English for many years. I don't have to justify anything to you. Certainly not. But I'm sure you already know much about me. Is it not natural I should want to know something about you? You should understand, comrade. We are not on this mission to become friends. We are on this mission to represent the Soviet Union on the world stage. I see. Well, at least I shall have my piano. What will you have? <laughs> That's, that is not my job. But you... You will have this. What is that? The address you will give to Saturday afternoon session. You should use the time to become familiar with I can't give this talk. It denounces Stravinsky. He is my friend. That's the proof text. It cannot be changed. You are expected to give the talk at the conference. If you choose not to, well, I suppose we'll get through that. But then you'll only be writing music for things like The Silly Little Mouse for the rest of your life. See, they've given you my entire file. 
no, I, I don't want to rush you into it, of course. That's why I gave you the text now. It's very kind. Along with the vodka. To help you get through the bad things in life, yes? I will study the text. Blackout. Lights up on the entryway of a sleeping room at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Dimitri in a blocky overcoat and another man in a better suit enter. So you had a pleasant trip then? I don't know if I can say pleasant. It was long, but I could drink and smoke, so that helped. Uh, how many of us are in this room? Well, just you. Is there something else or someone else you wanted to stay with? Uh, not at all. I, it's just I am not used to having this much space to myself. But I forget that New York is not like Moscow. But do you have American cigarettes? They would have them downstairs. I'm not with the Waldorf Astoria. Oh, I am so sorry. It was most confusing there in the lobby. I completely understand. We thought it'd be best to give each member of your delegation a, a personal escort uh, to their room, you know, and I'm yours. Harlow Shapley, at your service. Uh, you're with the conference then? Yes, but please understand. Well, the official name of this event is the Cultural, or Cultural and Scientific Congress for World Peace. Uh, it's being put on by the National Council of Arts, Sciences, and Professions. We have no connection to any government, yours or mine, despite what you might think of or what you might write of in the press. I saw a sign up front that said, Communist Front. That is what they think. Unfortunately, yes, but all we want to talk about is intellectual freedom and world peace. And I as well. I am not even a member of Communist Party. You're not? No, even though that's caused me some trouble over the years. I suppose someday I'll have to join, if only to get my children into the good schools. Will you need uh, to be calling them back? No, the service is not that good. And I'm quite sure someone other than my family would be listening. Where, where is the baggage? I believe it's coming from the airport. Something about customs. These days, they don't have many Russian uh, tourists. Do you need anything else? I don't know which I would like first. A cigarette or vodka? There's some vodka right here. Shall I pour you a glass or take off your coat? Uh, thank you. Do they have vodka in all the rooms here? I don't think so. I believe uh, this is just a welcome gift. Here you are. You must be tired. I am. We crossed so many time zones. I don't know how long it is since I left Moscow. I see the sun is down, but uh, what does that mean? Indeed. Do you need anything like, I don't know, a piano? Um, I mean, to do your work while you're here. And certainly not now. And I don't think I'll have time for any serious work in the next few days. So I guess you could call this a vacation. I'm told they want me to play something Sunday evening at a concert hall. Uh, so I should like to see that in the morning. Then tomorrow night, we see the New York Philharmonic with Tokowski. He's doing something by Khachaturian, which I will like because Khachaturian is one of the composers we haven't heard much lately. That includes you as well? So you know about that over here? We knew about it as soon as it happened, but I'm sure we don't know all of it. No. Although Comrade Stalin tells us there is to be no more banning of music, at least our music. Yeah. Will there be a tour of the city? Well, there are those sightseeing buses over uh, on Times Square, but they might, they might even stop by to pick you up here. You could do that tomorrow afternoon if you have the time. I will make time. Because then the Congress starts and uh, I will have no time for anything else. I'm not particularly looking forward to it. Why not? You've come all this way and you'll be meeting people from all over, not just communists. There is that. But it's what I am told I must do. Look, you're not KGB, are you? <laughs> Certainly not. We don't... Uh... I didn't think so. Our secretary is. 
Ivan Pozarsky. <laughs> doesn't surprise me. He doesn't smile much. Hmm. I don't know if he can even take notes. He's here to watch what we do and tell us what to do. That's the part that bothers me. We had heard that you might be, or that you might not be writing your own speeches. I don't know about the others, but I was given a text that fairly denounces Stravinsky. He is a friend. I cannot do that. What happens if you don't? Right now, nothing. But when we get back to Moscow, I will probably have to divorce my wife so she and the children will not be associated with me. And of course, I will have less and less work to do. And if you do? I might go back to teaching at the conservatory. I'll have commissions again. My family can buy some new clothes. And Stravinsky will never speak to me again. Not an easy choice. Is there anything I can do to help? I don't think so. On Friday, I'll, hit, I'll give you a short talk at the evening session. Come up to my room, settle in with the vodka to get ready for the big speech on Saturday. Uh, perhaps uh, you could get me another bottle. I, I don't think this one will last. Dimitri, if I may call you that, I don't think that will be a very that's very productive or healthy. I'm Russian and I'm not happy. What else would you suggest? I'm not sure, but I'll try to think of something. We probably won't see each other tomorrow, but we'll definitely talk on Friday. And that, then what will you have? Fabergé Easter egg? Perhaps. Lights to black. Lights up on Dimitri standing behind a podium on a longish table with Pazarsky sitting next to him. At rise, he turns a page as Dimitri does, and he turns another page as the speech ends. And so, my fellow artists, I reaffirm the support for your efforts from the army of all the Soviet musicians in our great country. We work as one people to advance the greater glory of the Soviet people and Mother Russia. Indeed, not only in our country, but throughout the world, we must work for unity among progressive workers in the field of culture. At the same time, we must recognize that this will not be easy, since there are new aspirants to world domination who seek to control all forms of expression. And in this, we must be vigilant. This is also true as we seek to overcome the forces of formalism who seek to return us to the dark days of yesteryear. I urge artists and creative people everywhere to join our fighters for peace as we struggle to overcome those forces of darkness. Indeed, it is not necessary to look far to see evidence of this struggle all about us. In Greece, China, Palestine, Vietnam, Indonesia, and even Madagascar. The forces of progress are confronted by those of colonialism and imperialism at every step. May our struggle for peace, life, and human dignity, our struggle against war, death, and barbarism, unite and strengthen our forces and serve the cause of the true rebirth and full flowering of the musical arts of our times. And I'll answer a few questions, but not too many, please. I think I'm still on Moscow time. <clears throat> Mr. Shostakovich, can you answer in detail the effect of any criticism by the Soviet government and the integrity of the artist? Oh, well, uh, of, of course it is Always gratifying when the, the people in the governments take notice of our work, and they often have good suggestions. Our musical criticism, reflecting the life and movement of our music, brings me much good, since it helps me to move my music forward. Mm. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your attention during this session, which is now concluded. We trust everyone will rest up and join us tomorrow morning for the scientific panel. Ah, Mr. Shokastovich, can I have a word with you about tomorrow's session? Of course, comrades. Oh, sorry, your forms of address are different here. Not a problem. Not a problem at all, sir. Um, so it's part of the fun of having an international conference in New York. One has the chance to work with people from many different cultures. A pleasure we don't often get in Moscow because the distances are so great. Uh, Comrade Pesarsky. Yes. Mili Jerzba, do zvedania. We're not supposed to speak Russian at these, at these sessions. Oh, <laughs> I do hope you won't get in trouble. Yeah, not for that. So what do you wish to speak to me about? Well, as I said, it's about tomorrow's session. Your talk is still the same? It is, and it just left the room. I see. And you're still entirely comfortable with presenting it? Mm. I am not at all comfortable with presenting it. Is there more vodka in my room? Well, uh, just that one bottle. Yeah, that will not be enough. <laughs> Dimitri, I trust you're aware that I'm kind of responsible for looking after your well-being while you're here. Yes, that is why you must bring me the vodka. I think I have a better idea. Have you ever been over to Broadway? Yes, on the tour. Uh, it's where all the theaters are. Many more theaters than Moscow. But of course you haven't seen any shows there. No time. But it would still be good if you could take just a little time to become familiar with that very vital part of the culture here in New York. I don't want to go out again. It's too cold. Do you remember that woman you met earlier this evening? Uh, Lillian Hellman? Uh, yes, very smart. Not too good looking. She writes for the theater, yes? She does. So, of course, she knows a lot of people who work in the theater as well. I was, I was talking with her earlier today, and she re recommended someone who could let you know firsthand what it's like to work in a New York theater. I don't want to talk. I want to drink until I pass out. I think you'll like her. Her name is Claudia Caswell. Lillian says she's a sweet, wonderful girl who can't act her way up off a paper bag. Even so, she has a good sense of humor and thinks, well, <laughs> on her feet. Or lying down, as the case may be. Uh, what, what is paper bag? It's a figure of speech. I managed to call her this afternoon, and she said she could be here in about 20 minutes. You'll have to hurry up to your room. Can I stop and get the vodka first? I don't think so. You'll be, or I don't think you'll be needing it. See, see you for lunch, unless you want to listen to the scientists. Yeah, that will not be happening. Am I not permitted to decline your hospitality? Please keep an open mind, and I think you two will get along quite well. Blackout. Lights up on Dimitri's room. Moment. Come in. He reappears, heading straight for the vodka, obviously paying more attention to that than to who has just arrived, who enters right after him. This is Miss Caswell, about his height, an attractive, shapely blonde woman in her 20s who wears a nice fur coat and carries a small jeweled purse. You are Miss Caswell, yes? And you are... Mr. Shostakovich. You say it correctly. Mr. Shapley told me how to pronounce it. You did a good job. <laughs> oh. Is it okay if I take my coat off? Uh, oh, uh, yes. <laughs> but you must permit me to take it off you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, this is a very nice coat. In Russia, this would cost uh, very many rubles. Oh, yeah, I guess it would. Probably cost a lot in dollars, too. Uh, you, you don't know how much it cost? A guy I met once said I made him feel good, so he wanted to make me feel good. So he gave me that. A girl has to take what she can get. Yes, of course. Uh, well, um, well, 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 what do you mean? No. I see you're drinking. <laughs> mm. Yes, <laughs> you must excuse me. Uh, I only drink when I am nervous. Well, Mr. Shapley says that's pretty much all the time. Uh, he knows me too well. <laughs> So I thought maybe I could help with that. Uh, wh what do you mean? Why don't we go sit down? That'll help us get to know each other better. Unless you'd like to get acquainted with standing up. But, uh, that, that would be fine. Yeah. Are you KGB? What's that? Does that have something to do with equity? Oh, I've got my equity card in here somewhere. What is equity? Well, the actor's union, of course. You, you can't get a decent job if you're not a member of the union. No, we have something like that in Russia. But so far, I'm not a member. But doesn't that hurt you when you're trying to get work? No, but other things do. Such as what? It's a very long story. It helps that I can write music. That's what Mr. Shapley said. Anything I might know? Mm, I don't think so. Mostly for orchestras, some for films. You mean movies? What, what kind of movies? Well, all different kinds. Uh, but I don't think the Russian films have uh, played in New York. Anything for Broadway? Oh, no. In Moscow, I have uh, written music for some plays, uh, but I think we have nothing like you have here. You should try to see a musical while you're here. Kiss Me Kate is really good, and I hear South Pacific is going to be a huge hit. It opens in two weeks. I'm afraid I'll be back in Moscow by then. Oh, too bad. You know, if you were going to stay a little longer, maybe you could write a little something for me. Uh, I, I don't know that I... I can sing, you know. I've got a vocal coach. I've been studying with him for nearly two years. Do you want to hear something? I don't know your songs. Well, here. <clears throat> How about our national anthem? They sing it at baseball games. <clears throat> oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam? Yes, yes, I see that you can sing. Thank you. But that's a difficult song. Now, I always thought uh, God Save the Tsar was an easy song to sing, but uh, of course, uh, you can't sing that anymore. Why not? Yeah, another very long story. Perhaps if you get to Moscow, uh, we can uh, work together. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't even have a passport. Guess I should get one, huh? It would help you to take advantage of opportunities that might come your way. Oh, I am so selfish and not a gentleman. Can I offer you a drink? Don't mind if I do. I'm afraid all I have is vodka. Oh, that's okay. I can drink almost anything. When you live in New York, you kind of have to learn to do that. Have you always lived in New York? Oh, no. Someone once told me that everyone in New York came here from somewhere else. In my case, it was Kansas. I just clicked my ruby slippers together and came east after the war. What are uh, ruby slippers? You know, that Dorothy had in The Wizard of Oz. Who is Dorothy? Maybe we shouldn't talk about movies. <laughs> uh, what do you do for fun back home? I, I drink uh, when I'm not uh, working on music. In Moscow, people have learned to be afraid of having too much fun. I've heard that. How about sports? Bad eyes. And I always wanted to be inside with my music. You don't have baseball in Russia, do you? No, but I have heard of it. 
I think the Yankees are starting up right about now. You should see a game. But I guess if you can't stay for South Pacific, you can't stay for the Yankees, huh? Mm. Yeah, that's correct. I have to give my speeches, uh, play a little concert, and then they go where they tell me. What are your speeches about? About the struggle of artists everywhere to express themselves and the fight for intellectual freedom and world peace, I think. What do you mean you think? Didn't you write your speeches? No. Are you sure you're not a KGB? Look, if you want to see my equity card, I'll have to get my purse. <laughs> no, no, you can stay as you are. In Russia, we are suspicious of everything. <laughs> I guess so. Doesn't sound like a very fun place. It's not. So, you're an actress. <clears throat> Have you been in many plays? A couple. Uh, those auditions are murder, you know? Some of those people have been in places like Juilliard. Kind of tough competition for a little old girl from Wichita High School. <laughs> but uh, you are in school plays, yes? Oh yeah, yeah, lots of them. One of my teachers said I had great natural charm. I was very popular. Made friends real easy. I mean, easily. <laughs> I think English is a more difficult language than Russian. So <laughs> many strange rules. <laughs> yeah. Another one of my teachers said I got to work on my grammar to make a good impression. So that's why I try to use body language as much as I can. It's kind of universal, you know? So uh, do you want to give me lessons? In what? Body language, in case I want to work on Broadway. Oh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> you know, I said I'd been in a couple of plays. They were really just walk-ons, but the director said I walked very well. One of them even gave me a private audition. <laughs> you know, for movement and that. Really? You know, I don't think I can give you a whole course or anything, but I think I can show you some of the basic movements. Maybe we can do the graduate course later. <laughs> uh, that would be for my next visit to New York. Sure. Now then. <clears throat> she proceeds to demonstrate her movements, which are actually without much real difference in facial expression, although she does move very well. This one is happy. Do you see that? Of course. And this one is... Sad. You got that? Certainly. Now this one I call welcome or glad to see you. Does that work for you? Oh, yes. I think you have to kind of get ready for this one. It's angry. Oh, yes. I can see that one very well. But then this one's really different. It's shy. Yes, yes, that is, that is different. Now, here's a contrast. After shy, we have proud. Indeed. That's quite a contrast. And then this next one just kind of came naturally. All I have to do is remember this girl that cut in front of me at an audition. I call it spoiling for a fight. Yes, I see it. That's <laughs> wonderful. Gee, thanks. <laughs> uh, do you take requests? Huh? I mean, uh, can I give you a mood or, or a word and uh, you can do a movement for that? Oh, sure. So what about uh, resentful? Oh, that's easy. Let's see. <clears throat> Very good. <laughs> And uh, you must forgive me uh, this is, if this is going too far, but uh, I would like to see uh, seductive. Hmm. Do you have that word in Russian? Something like it. Well, I'm thinking maybe there aren't too many Russian movies with girls like Hedy Lamar, so I'd better use some dialogue with this one. I am Tondaleo. That's excellent. <laughs> I think you should sit down now. Oh, okay. So, did you like that? Yes, very much. 
ever see anybody do something like that before? No. In Russia, they are very serious and always want to talk about creating a character. Well, I want to talk about creating a character too. I, I am an actress, you know. It's just that I think I can probably do better with movement than with words. So did that help? Help with what? With your nerves and everything. <laughs> yes, it did. Very much. Good. I knew I was the right girl for the job. You seem to be in good physical condition. Did you do sports in school? Me? Girls don't do sports at Wichita High. But I was a cheerleader, so that kept me moving around a lot. What, what is cheerleader? Oh, at the football games, you know, with the pom-poms. Sis boom ba, sis boom ba. <laughs> it was my job to get everyone excited. <laughs> I'm sure you did that well. <laughs> At this moment, Miss Caswell, I am reminded of a time many years ago in Russia. I was in, uh, you would call it high school. It was after the revolution, but things were, diff uh, things were not that different yet. I was in the, it was in the winter and many of our school friends had gathered at a big house in the country for an outdoor party. It must have been cold. <laughs> oh, it was. But our family still had nice furs and good coats. And there was a sleigh. Here, let me show you. He picks up a coat and settles down, tossing the coat over the two of them like a sleigh cover. Oh, I think I know this. I saw an old picture once. I mean, it was a painting, not a real photo or anything. And these two people were in a sleigh and it looked like the horses were going real fast because right behind them was a pack of wolves with big fangs and everything. Do you mean like that? Uh, not exactly. Uh, we had the sleigh, but we didn't have the wolves, uh, which was a good thing. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I don't remember any sleighs in Kansas, mostly just old cars. There, now we're all set. <laughs> just like I remember. Is this uh, going to be our bed or what? <laughs> no, uh, this is just for fun. You said I should have more fun, so here we are. <laughs> Except uh, back then, Irina Petrova was where you are. And she was? From Kiev. Uh, she was visiting her, visiting her cousin, Natasha, who was in my class. Mm. I had not seen her before. So how did you two end up in the sleigh together? She asked me. I was the only boy there wearing glasses, and she asked me to come out to the sleigh with her. I know some girls. They always go for the brainy ones. They think that means the one with glasses, but you can't always tell. Did you leave your glasses on? No. She took them off. So how did you see? I couldn't. I had to use my hands. Well, that sounds romantic. Everything went okay? Oh, yes. It was the first time I had sex with a woman. I'm kind of thinking she was older than you, right? She was. And now I'm kind of thinking I'm maybe like half your age, right? No, there are not always exact parallels in life. I'm not sure I understand that. You don't have to. Oh, good. In that case, I have a suggestion. Why don't I take off your glasses? I, I can't see without them. So I guess you'll just have to use your hands, huh? Or your fingers. Mr. Shapley said you have a very talented fingers. You could probably play all ABA keys on the piano. Maybe not that many, but it's true. They're very supple. What's supple? It means... I could do many wonderful things with them. In that case, I'll just take off your glasses right now, okay? There. How's that? Can't see a thing. Good. Now, don't you want to turn out the lights? No, uh, there could be an emergency. <laughs> like what? Well, the hotel could catch fire. Hotel fires happen in Russia all the time. The hotels are very old. Yeah, well, this place is younger than I am. 
I don't think we're going to have a problem with that. Perhaps. As long as I lie right here, I, it is okay. Mm. But if anything else happens, I, I won't be able to see where I am going. Well, of course not. If the lights are out, it could be dark. That's true. But I don't know my way around here like I do my apartment in Moscow. So, what do you feel right now? You? That's very good. So, can you help me get out of my dress? It's a zipper. I will try. You know, this might work better if we could just stand up. No. We must stay here and protect ourselves from the snow. And the wolves. Don't forget about the wolves. <laughs> Those two. There. I think I started it for you. <laughs> Thanks. Now you'll have to let me return the favor. Ooh. That's kind of big. My pants are still on. I was talking about your belt buckle, silly. Oh, that was a gift from my wife. Well, we'll have to get rid of that right now, won't we? Too bad we don't have a, a radio or a record player or something. You know, to make it more romantic. Well, I think this is very romantic. But of course, I'm hearing music all the time. What about you? Not really. So, what are you hearing right now? I guess I should say violins, because that's what everyone thinks of for romance. But it, it's not. Well, don't keep me in suspense. For some reason, I hear loud music with a crescendo. Oh. <laughs> I know what a crescendo is. Let me help you with that. Blackout. Intermission. Act two. We hear the general murmur and commotion in the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria. Ah, good morning, sir. I take it you slept well? Very well, thank you. And thank you for sending Miss Caswell. You're most welcome. Did she work your, uh, her special magic for you? You might say that. That's probably why I overslept this morning. And she was gone when I got up. I hope I didn't offend her. Oh, no. She said she'd have, uh, she'd have to leave early because she had an audition this morning. How late did she stay? All night. Oh, I see. Well, I hope that uh, I hope that helps study your nerves for today's session. Oh yes, very much. I have a much clearer head for what I must do. Good. You know, this is most fortunate because I was going to have to hunt you down anyway. Just this morning, my secretary gave me this letter, which was really intended for you, but found its way back on my desk instead. <laughs> I guess they didn't know uh, you'd be staying here. Really. Yes, from the American Federation of Musicians. They want you to know, or they want to know, um, or they want me to invite you to take a permanent residence in this country. They, which is the president, will sponsor you for that. Really? Uh, of this, course. This, this is most interesting. Of course, of course. You don't have to give them an answer right away. I mean, it's, it's before breakfast. Yeah. Uh, what, what is this group? The American Federation of Musicians, uh, a labor group. They work for better pay, job opportunities, musicians' rights, and that sort of thing. Of course, we have nothing like that in Soviet Union. <laughs> I didn't think so. Shall I give this to you, or do you want me to hang on to it? Oh, please, you keep it. That's not something I can think about just now. My work, my family, everything is in Moscow. I have several works that are not yet completed. I thought that would be the case. And even if I am in a mad moment, I wanted, even if in a mad moment I wanted to uh, defect, that is the word, yes, it would not be possible. You see Comrade Pejarsky over there? He is watching me. Like uh, we have expression, uh, like a fox on chickens. 
I had noticed that. So we must try to speak normally, as if nothing important is being discussed. Certainly. Is that good enough? I should think so. There was that woman last year uh, who jumped out of a window to defect. I heard of that. But if I were to jump out of my window here, I would kill myself, which is not something I want to do just now. Has that ever been the case in the past? Only when I am denounced, which has happened twice now. Then life is very difficult. I should think so. It's good that you have to work or you have your work to keep you busy. In such times, I have to write for myself. I put those works in a drawer for later. Sometimes I look at the scientists and wonder if it would be easier doing that work. You may never know, because I'm afraid you're a little late for the scientific session. No matter. I'm sure they will do very well without me. Where do you recommend for breakfast? Well, there's a very nice little restaurant down on the first floor, although you could just wait a little longer and have lunch with the scientists. Uh, that might give me indigestion. Do you know of a restaurant nearby that uh, might have a nice Russian breakfast? I, I don't think so. Uh, at least not in the neighbor or in this neighborhood, anyways. Exactly. What do you have for breakfast in Moscow? Uh, just lately, it's been anything I can get. My children and wife come first, of course. So it's not unusual for me to just have two meals a day. It was much easier when I worked at the conservatory. So I understand. Well, you know, if you eat in the restaurant downstairs, you can charge it to your room and Comrade Pazarski will have to pay for it. <laughs> Isn't that just a comforting thought? Well, very much so. Well, I see you at the afternoon panel. Certainly. I'm making it a point to be at all the sessions, except I'm afraid oh, the scientific one. I understand completely. I'll see you later then. Blackout. Lights up on the speaker's table. A bland, portly man stands behind the podium, with Dimitri sitting to one side of it, Pazarski to the other. <clears throat> Um, thank you for, uh, thank you all for attending our panel today on fine arts uh, this afternoon. We have many distinguished speakers who will share with you their views on achieving freedom of expression within the various forms of the fine arts. <clears throat> uh, uh, from the United States, we have, and I must, uh, I, I must do this in alphabetical order, uh, lest my job as music critic might spill over into this form. Erin <clears throat> uh, Copeland, uh, Philip Evergood, Clifford Odets, Nicholas Goyen, uh, that's uh, re representing our neighbors to the south, and from the Soviet Union, <clears throat> uh, Dmitry Shostakovich <clears throat> was that in alphabetical order. Yes, okay. <clears throat> uh, I realize that uh, I'm just up here to, to get things started, but uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, I, and perhaps this will help to get things started, I must take this opportunity to restate what I have written about Mr. Shostakovich and his works. <clears throat> First, I must say that I regard music as a universal language which reaches across national borders. That is, you don't have to be French to know that La Marseillaise is, is, uh, is about liberty. And going further east, you don't know, you don't have to know Russian to appreciate the music and the great composers of the, of the past 100 years. Uh, Borodin, uh, Mus Gorsky, Tchaikovsky, Rimsky Korsakov, and more recently, Serge Sergei Prokofiev, uh, Aram Kachatorian, uh, Nikolai Masakovsky, Alexander Skraben, and Dmitri 
Kabalevsky. Some would include the other Dmitri on this list, uh, that is Mr. Shostakovich, but I don't. While the passions of wartime fanned the flames of admiration for his seventh and eighth symphonies, I merely found them to be long. Moreover, I strongly suspected in them the presence of a subversive influence, that of the music of Gustav Mahler. Many of you know that my colleagues in the American uh, press have complained that I am too big of a fan uh, of the Soviet composers that I have just mentioned. But at the same time, uh, some in the Soviet press have denounced me as a bourgeois foe. That being the case, I don't want to be seen as some kind of polarizing influence. So at this point, I will simply sit down and listen. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Philip Evergood. Uh, thank you. I have to say, I certainly feel lucky that my work has escaped notice by Mr. Downs. <laughs> And now, the man I'm sure you've all been waiting to hear, coming all the way to us from Moscow in the Soviet Union, Mr. Dmitry Shostakovich. Thank you. Thank you. You have given me a very nice welcome on my first trip to America. It is even warmer here than it is in Moscow, which is always good. I regret I'm not very accomplished in what people call polite conversation. So I think the best thing to do is just to get on with my talk. As Mr. Downs has so kindly noted, we have a great tradition of heroic music in the Soviet Union. This of course began after our glorious revolution. That was in 1917, as you may know when Comrade Lenin formulated the basic structure of the new Soviet society. In particular, with respect to music, he said that it must be a democratic art, possessing great social force and required to educate the masses, to raise their cultural level, their conscience, and their creative power. In the years since then, we have vigorously pursued this dictum so that today, in just the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic alone, we have 97,000 non-professional music collectives and one and a half million participants in music. In this number, we, can, we include not only the very many members of orchestras and choral groups throughout the RSFSR, but also the army of young musicians in the higher schools who fight for world peace as they sing and play instruments. The great penetration of music throughout Soviet culture has led to a flowering of our culture of folk music, much of which was brutally suppressed by the imperialist forces before the revolution. We have built theaters in every major city to pre present this music of our glorious folk culture. In the Ukrainian SSR, there are 36. In the Belarusian SSR, 27. The Uzbek SSR, 11. The Kazakh SSR, 43. The Georgian SSR, 19. The Azerbaijan SSR, 18. The Lithuanian SSR, 17. The Moldovian SSR, 12 the Latvian SSR 15, the Kyrgyz SSR 21, the Tajik SSR 11, the Armenian SSR 9, the Turkmen SSR 14, the Estonian SSR 11, the Karelo Finnish SSR 10, and then of course in the RSFSR we have 236. At the same time we have been vigilant 
against the ever-present threat of racism, most horribly exemplified by Adolf Hitler and heinous crimes he committed, not only in Germany, but also in the Soviet Union and other peaceful nations he attempted to conquer. We note too that racism exists in the oppressed areas controlled by the colonialist powers around the world, but even now those oppressed peoples are struggling to win their freedom. Rest assured that we seek, that we seek personal freedom for all the peoples of many backgrounds who live peaceful lives within the 16 republics which compose the Soviet Union today. And now I, I feel, I am indisposed. I must sit down. Hey. I said to continue for Comrade Satos, Satogovich, and uh, so you have heard the, the bright picture of musical life in the Soviet Union of 1949. Uh, yet still there are troubling things which occur on a regular basis. As I noted earlier, Comrade Lenin set forth the sound principles of socialist realism to guide the composition of music as we work to enlighten the masses. Although nearly every and all sensible persons recognize the truth of his teaching, there are still a few individuals who work against the goals of the state and persist in the use of formalism in their music. Formalism displays the degeneracy, the hollowness of the pseudo-culture, which lacks a national and popular base. With the disgusting features of cosmopolitanism, realism, on the other hand, is of and for the people, beautiful and transparent. While formalism is nihilistic and ignores the audience. For example, of this, we need to look no further than Igor Stravinsky, who actually said, the mass in relation to art is a quant quantitative term which has never once entered into my considerations. My music does not express anything realistic. That is, the masses are of no concern to him, as he flies in the face of realism. Only somewhat less egregious is Sergei Grokovic who devotes himself to big and significant themes as he searches for a realistic play. As you may be aware, it was just a year ago that Comrades and Doyle pointed out from the Supreme Soviet of the RSFSFR that I myself had developed formalism in my work and he was obliged to note this due to the demand of the people. In those of my works, especially those of the post-war years, in which I departed from the big themes and contemporary images, I lost my contact with the people, and I failed. My work found a response only among the narrow strata of sophisticated musicians, but they failed. To meet uh, with how I was regarded, with the greater acceptance from the masses. It is gratifying that my music for the film, The Young God, based on the book by Comrade Vateyev, who spoke yesterday, is a recent success in this direction. We have now, all of us, just come through a great and terrible war. And we're all here to work for world peace for our time. And so it is also my hope that the young artists everywhere, who must be the ones who are building our new world of peace, can join together to create the progressive art with natural culture and realism. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention at this afternoon session. I know it's getting late and the hotel wants to chase us out of here so they can get ready for the dinner, but we do have time for just one or two questions, which would be for Mr. Shokatovich rather than Mr. Prozarski, yes? That is correct. They're in the second row. Um, uh, for Mr. Shostakovich, I have two questions. First, do you agree with the recent bilious attacks in the Soviet press on Paul Hindemith, Arnold Schoenberg, and Igor Stravinsky? And second, how can free cultural exchange exist when the USSR has disallowed the performance of virtually all of the modern Western repertoire? Alarmed, Pozarski lunges across behind the podium to whisper obviously into Dmitry's ear. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Shokatovich can now respond. I think. 
After a beat, Dmitri waves away Pizarski, who then returns to his seat, not entirely satisfied, as Dmitri rises to stand at the podium. Yes, yes, uh, Mr. Pizarski was just asking if he could get me some antacids, but that won't be necessary. <laughs> These are valid questions which merit a frank and candid response. I must say that I do agree with the criticism of the composers you mentioned, because of course they are formalist and do not compose in a realistic style which can reach the masses. Regarding what works from the West are being played in the Soviet Union these days, I am generally busy, so I don't get to attend that many concerts. But I'm confident that the best works from the West will always have a place in a Soviet repertoire. I hope that answers your question. Well, if it doesn't, <laughs> that will have to do. Because I see the hotel people making faces at me from way back there in the back of the room. Thank you again for attending, and we'll see you again for dinner soon. Perhaps I should apologize, sir. I thought we were all friends here. And so we are, Mr. Shapley. I see this as nothing more than an, an honest disagreement among friends. And not at all like Comrade Zdanov last year. That was an attack. Yes, but that was last year. And I would hope this will be the, this year would be better. It already is. I'm in New York at the Waldorf Astoria. I understand that from many people, life cannot be better than that. I guess it depends on your standards. Will you be getting out tonight? No. I think it's best that I stay here. I still must have dinner, and I'd like to be well rested for tomorrow. I still have to perform, you know. And there are too many places to have fun in New York. I'm sure one could go all night, going from one place to another. Quite so. Not that I ever have, but I'll see you at breakfast then. Certainly. I've met some people from California, which I am told is a magical place. That'll be our time to talk more about it. And I'll, uh, after that, I'll be going over to your Madison Square Garden to get ready for my little concert. We're all looking forward to that. Here we're talking about art and artists and the whole weekend, and <laughs> that's the only entertainment on the whole program. It would be so much better with an orchestra, but of course there's no time to rehearse. That and the fact that <laughs> the conference couldn't afford to pay the musicians, you know, the, un the unions, you know. <laughs> of course. But that makes me think, uh, Am I to be paid for all of this? I'm sure you have better rates than the Ministry of Culture. <laughs> well, <laughs> I should think you would need a work permit for that. And it's a little late to get one, but, but then if, if you're sharing your work with your fellow delegates as your contribution to the success of the conference and as a representative of the best music in the Soviet Union today, well, then there's no problem then I guess there will be no problem. So I will be like one of those men on the street corner who play a song and ask you to throw money into their violin case. My friends in Moscow will be most amused to learn that the American way of life includes beggars on the street corners. Those men are not, we have programs. <laughs> the, the mayor has talked to some of them himself and it does no good. All I can say is that's how they they chose to live. Freedom of expression, that sort of thing. But don't you see? This is something I can tell my friends in Moscow so they can think that life in Moscow is better than life in New York. When you and I know, that is not the case. So you don't have beggars in Moscow? No. They would be shot. And now you must excuse me. I must be getting up to my room. Of course, sir. Those Vidanya. <laughs> Blackout. Lights up on the interior of Dimitri's room at the Waldorf as seen in Act One as he is arranging things in an open suitcase on the settee. There are several cartons of contemporary cigarettes and a mostly empty vodka bottle on the small table. Moment! My bag is not yet ready. 
Oh, hello. Hi. Okay, if I come in? Yes, of course. I thought you were from the transport service for my bag. <laughs> Not likely. I don't think I could handle the heavy lifting. I called at Mr. Shapley at his office, and he said you might still be here. Only just. Uh, we are to leave within the hour. Oh. You sure you can't stay till Friday? No, everything is set. Why? Well, I can't tell you what I had to do to get these, but I came up with two tickets to opening night of South Pacific. Oh, that's, uh, that's that very big musical you talked about. <laughs> I've read of it. Right. It's the hottest ticket on Broadway. And you have two of them. Mm-hmm. I was at an audition and I met this producer. I didn't get the part, but he asked me to another audition later. And I saw he had his friend from out of town who'd like to see the show. I guess he liked my style because here we are. <laughs> so you got these tickets for me? Well, yeah. It's supposed to be really good. And I figured you'd never get another chance to see it. I'm so sorry, Miss Caswell. There's nothing I can do. Your government says we must leave today, no extensions. I have several invitations to speak at universities, but they are firm. Sorry to hear that. Is there someone I could call? Mm, it's your State Department in Washington. They might not take a call from a Claudia Caswell from Kansas. You'd be surprised. Last month, I was at a party, and I met this undersecretary of something. I've got this card here somewhere in my purse. He said to give him a call if I was in town. Oh, no, no, really, really. Thank you for trying. <laughs> but if we tried to make a change now, it would only cause trouble. Perhaps your government simply does not want me to see South Pacific. Why? It's a love story about World War II set in Tahiti or someplace like that. In that case, it's probably my government that does not want me to see it. World War II in Russia was cold and nasty and many people died. I think no one fell in love. Gee, that sounds kind of sad. It was. But as I said, I have to finish packing. I'm almost done. Go right ahead. Gee, <laughs> you sure have a lot of cigarettes. Can't you get them in Russia? Not like these. Tobacco does not grow in the Soviet Union, so we have to get cigarettes from Bulgaria. Most of the time, it's like smoking old rope. Sounds nasty. Looks like you'll need an extra suitcase just for those. I don't think so. The baggage people will steal them. These travel with me. If you say so. You taking anything else back? Gifts for the family, stuff like that? Not yet. I've had too little time to shop, but people I have met here have felt it necessary to give me a good amount in American dollars, which will cause a problem if I return to Moscow with more money than I had when I left. Maybe you could get some traveler's checks. Mm, same problem, but maybe worse. So I will spend these dollars in Ireland. What's in Ireland? In the airport there, uh, our last stop before crossing the ocean, they had this shop called Duty Free. I have not seen such a shop before. Another traveler told me they have many luxury goods, but without the luxury taxes. So I will spend my dollars for jewelry and perfume and the like. And when I get to Moscow, I can simply say they were gifts from friends, which will partly be true. Sounds good to me. Too bad you didn't get a few things coming this way. <laughs> they had no money. Perhaps on my next trip, whenever that may be. You think you'll still be in New York? When you're in show business, who knows? I've been here for three years now, and I haven't been in that many shows, but I've done all right for myself. Still, I'd like a real chance to flex my dramatic wings, if you know what I mean. I think so. My agent says I might want to try Hollywood, since they're making a lot of big movies these days, and I'd look really good in Technicolor. Ah, yes. California. Didn't you say you did music for movies in Russia? Hello. Maybe you could get work in Hollywood. I... That would be nice, but it's too far away. I don't think they know my work. 
hey, you played the gig at Madison Square Garden. They got to know you from that. That's true. And if they call you, you can be my agent. <laughs> really? In that case, feel free to use my name in Moscow. <laughs> Although maybe you will become inter internationally known before I am known in Hollywood. We'll see about that. You know, my agent also says I should think about television. They're doing more and more of it in New York. And he says there's a lot of opportunity for someone with a good personality, which is me. You have television in Moscow? Oh, yes. Uh, the television station began broadcasting last year. But I think very few people have television sets to receive any programs. I have read that it was a Russian man who invented your American television. From Russia? No. He came here after the revolution. But we are told that most of the good ideas come from Russia in some form or another. I don't know anything about that. What about Thomas Edison? Yeah, we are told that his grandfather was Russian. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Can you find another friend to use your tickets? No, oh, sure. I'll be the most popular girl in town. It's just that I wanted that friend to be you. Miss Caswell, I'm, I am deeply touched. You hardly know me. Well, we spent a night together. I like to think I know you pretty well. I suppose that's true. Can I get you a drink? Someone once told me that you shouldn't drink before noon. Uh, <laughs> we have no such rules in Russia. Well then, don't mind if I do, thanks. But I kind of thought you might want to take that back home with you. Eh, better we should drink it here. I'm sure I can buy more in Ireland. <laughs> Not that anything would be better than Russian vodka. Some things you guys do real well, huh? Hmm. We like to think so. As your advertising says, many satisfied customers. Here you are. And here's to good times with old friends. <laughs> as old as that, huh? You know, I was at a party last week with some friends, and I told them that I just took a sleigh ride with Dmitry Shostakovich at the Waldorf Astoria. <laughs> they looked at me like I was crazy. They can see why they might think so. Well, it happened, didn't it? Oh, certainly. It's just not the sort of thing one usually does in a hotel room. Well, what does one usually do in a hotel room? I've seen some pretty weird stuff in my time, and I'm not all that old. Well, I guess you meet new friends and see old ones again. I guess. That and get some sleep. Do you stay in a lot of hotels? More than I would like. But the Soviet Union is a big country, and it's always good to get back home. There's those ruby slippers again. What? The thing I like about traveling is you always make new friends, but then you got to stay in touch with them or everybody forgets. That can be hard. Sometimes I use a theme to remember. What's that? A, a theme, a, a signature phrase. Like you send a letter? Mm, not exactly. It's a series of notes in the music that uh, keep occurring throughout the piece. So you remember. Oh. I don't think I've ever heard one of those. I don't know much about your kind of music. I'm sure you have. What about, uh, bum, bum, ta, da, dum? Nope. Ah, well, uh, how about, bum, 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 da, 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 bum, bum? Doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> oh, I know. You've heard of Tchaikovsky, yes? Oh, sure. Well, then, uh, bum. Bum, ta -da, ta -dum. Yes, yes, that's None But the Lonely Heart, right? You read it for that movie with Cary Grant? His mother was dying of cancer. It was very sad. If you say so. But that's what I mean. A series of notes that you keep hearing throughout the piece. Just so you know, on Broadway, we call that a melody. Thank you. In any case, uh, that's what I used to remember a particular time or place, or person, a theme which is heard throughout the music. How do you know what theme to use? 
Well, it uh, just sort of comes to me. You know, uh, the creative process. A phrase occurs when I think of something. And that's the theme. It's very interesting. But did you want to tell me how you work or what? I thought you had a plane to catch. I do. But what I was going to say is uh, I might do a theme to remember you. Really? What do I sound like? I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Well, after you think about it, am I going to get to hear it? Yes and no. It will be part of a larger piece. People are asking me to write things all the time. Some of them go right to the concert hall. Others go into my drawer for a time when things might change. Will it say Miss Caswell's theme or something like that? <laughs> oh, no. Many times I put things in my music for others to find. I don't say it's there. Uh, that would spoil all the fun. So I'm afraid this will have to be our little secret. Okay. But can't you give me a hint? I mean, something to look for? Not that I could do it, of course, but I know a lot of people smarter than me. Well, it might... Uh... It might use something of your name. You have C's and A's in your name, yes? It could be a series of C's and A's together. I'll have to remember that. How fast do you work? As fast as I have to. If I were to write something next week, it might not be heard until the end of the year. Could you make it for a movie? Then I might have a better chance of hearing it. I'll have to see what happens. I'm so glad you stopped by, Miss Caswell. I will always remember our time together. Me too. <clears throat> you realize uh, the world being what it is, we will probably never see each other again. Yeah, too bad about that. So we should try to take full advantage of this moment. You say so. I think I would like to take off my glasses. I'll put them over here. And she gently removes them, holding them at her side, as he moves into a heartfelt kiss, even pushing her back somewhat on the settee. <laughs> Airport service, you got one bag or two? They practically tumble off the settee, he trying to locate and put on his glasses while she struggles to stand, straightening her clothes. <laughs> Moment. Moment. I guess that's my cue to leave, huh? Uh, I'm afraid so. Okay. But, hey, I learned a new word last week. Just for you. Dosvidania. Dosvidania, Miss Caswell. Blackout. The end. Thank you, everybody, and wonderful job, Pat. This show will stay up on our Facebook page, or you may view it on YouTube. Thank you for your continued support. Next week, we have an original work for you. The show is called Boondoggle by Peter McDonald from Aurora, Illinois. Thank you for watching, and see you all next week. <laughs>